And, um, and so, yes, yeah, so I want to now turn it over to our guest today. And um, Drew, you can introduce yourself and take it away. Hello, uh, can you uh, fill me in on the structure of what you want me to talk about, what, our, what the plan is for today? Sure. So uh, most of the teachers here that are um, logging on uh, teach either the grade 11 Indigenous Literature course known as NBE um, or they are English teachers that are utilizing a variety of texts um, in their classrooms or um, there could be just people who are interested in just generally hearing. Uh, so the focus would be just on the importance of centering Indigenous voices you bringing in Indigenous texts, and we've done a lot of work with um, most of the educators that are listening in today in terms of uh, professional development and really looking at, um, we've dug into looking at um, the importance of, of bringing in Indigenous voices into the classroom. Um, so really, and if, you know, this can be a very informal, um, space as well so if you're happy with people asking questions um, they can do so in the chat box if you're able sure to absolutely those. no problem great so i'm going to turn my video off so it'll just be focused on you for the time being and you can take it away how, for how long do you want me to talk uh we usually carve out about an hour so okay like give hour, or take. Uh, all right <laughs> All right, well, I'll start off for about 10, 15 minutes, and then as the questions come in, I can sort of uh, detail the conversation more towards that. Sure. Uh, hello, great. everyone. Um, as you know, my name is Drew Hayden Taylor, and I am one of those rare breeds of animals you'll come across a professional writer. That is to say, I do not have a day job. I do not spend my afternoons saying, would you like fries with that? Um, more than anything else, I see myself as a contemporary storyteller. Because uh, basically everything comes down to a good story. I think it's even mentioned in one of Tom King's books that in the end, we are all just stories. So uh, it used to be, as you know, storytelling began with oral narrative. Uh, everything was uh, history, knowledge, philosophy. Everything was passed through oral narrative. And then as uh, the various civilizations around the world grew, um, the expression of these stories, uh, the many different ways of telling stories began to grow. Um, you had radio, you had print, of course, all the different kinds of print, television, theater, all these different ways of telling stories. And even in today's world, you have um, even video games now have absolutely huge uh, narratives backing the stories that they do. Um, I was born and raised on the Curve Lake First Nation, which is just north of Peterborough. Um, born and raised there. I come from both at the, at the same time and a small family. I come from a big family because my mother was the oldest of 14. And I was 11 pounds. Evidently, that was enough for my mother. I like to think I gave her quantity. Anyways, I'm getting silly. I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, growing up on the reserve, you know, we had two channels. They were very snowy. And there's often not a lot to do on a reserve. Uh, you can only go swimming so many times, so many times to climb a tree, especially in winter. So I gravitated towards writing and or, or reading and I would read and I would read and I would read and I loved reading because every book I got from school out of the school library was like a passport someplace to meet interesting people, go on interesting adventures, um, oh. do things that, that basically a normal little blue eyed Ojibwe would not have the opportunity to do in a reserve. So the more I read, the more interested and excited I became in the concept of being a writer. Because one of the things a writer will tell you is that the world you create as a writer, um, it has to be as real, as detailed, as uh, detailed as the world you live in. And the people you write about have to be as three-dimensional as your best friends. So I found I had more control over the world I created in the world I lived in. And I like that. 
So I decided I wanted to be a writer. So uh, all the usual things happened. I decided I wanted to be a writer, but uh, I distinctly remember, this is why this is so very, very funny from what I was just told, um, my grade 11 English teacher. You know, uh, amongst Indigenous people, it's a very common thing that when you're seeking wisdom, you're seeking guidance, you want to know what to do, where to go, all those different things. Um, you go to an elder and seek guidance. And I went to my grade 11 English teacher, and I remember very distinctly, he was sitting at the table. At his desk in his homeroom, looking up, and I said, is it possible to make a living from creative writing? And without even looking up, he said, no, not really. This is my grade 11 English teacher. And that sort of struck a nerve. I, you know, it was sort of like I was looking for direction. This is my grade 11 English teacher. He knew more about this than I did. And he told me that there wasn't much point in being a writer. It wouldn't get me anywhere. So um, being a firm believer that the best revenge is living a good life. Decades went by. I became a writer, so uh, and uh, I, uh, things I frequently get to do uh, before as uh, COVID anything. I talk at a lot of schools uh, all all over North America and um, in in Europe and other places. And the one thing I talk about with them, you know, the the only wisdom I can bring them, the only thing I can share with them when they leave that room, the only thing that the nugget of information they need to take with them is never trust your Grade 11 English. The second person I went to was my mother. I told my mother I wanted to be a writer, and my mother looked at me with a very perplexed look and said, Why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. And again, that sort of struck home. I sort of I knew where my mother was coming from. My mother's first language was Anishinaabe. She'd had grade six education, had spent most of her time cooking, cleaning for white people. So being a writer was literally not on her radar. So my mother said, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. Again, that stayed with me. And still believing the best revenge is living a good life. The decades went by and I went to about 19 countries around the world. And I would send my mother postcards from each country saying, look, we're writing and got me. Um, <laughs> uh, so I did not have a lot of encouragement and I gave up wanting to be a writer. And it wasn't until my late teens, when through a series of circumstances, um, I was given the opportunity to become a writer. I done, uh, spent most of my 20s sort of working in um, the arts field, but not. I wanted to know artists. I wanted, you know, what's the whole term? Um, uh, I want to be a hanger on, I'm with a band type of person. So I would worked in all these different jobs that were affiliated with the arts world, but not as an artist. I worked for CBC as a trainee radio producer. Uh, I did the sound on a bunch of documentaries, uh, film location sound. Um, I worked for a film company or I worked on a television series. Um, I worked for the Canadian Native Arts Foundation, all these different things. And through a bizarre series of circumstances, I started writing for television. So I keep talking about the importance of, of storytelling. Storytelling covers almost everything I do. As you may or may not know, I'm known as a playwright, a novelist, short story writer. I write um, nonfiction, essays and articles, documentaries, just about anything and everything. And I'm a firm believer that once you know, 50% uh, of whatever you're working on is understanding the structure of what you're writing. The story is all there, but how do you begin that story? How do you end that story? And how do you go from the beginning to the ending? It's understanding the structure of the genre you're working on. Some genre like television is highly structured. You're just basically putting clothes on an existing skeleton. Um, theater has a bit of a structure and understanding that when you're writing, whether it's one act or two acts, um, same with novels, same with movies, etc. It's just understanding what the structure of what you're trying to write. So um, I started off writing for television and then I went into theater, which is very, very ironic because I, uh, growing up, I didn't know anything about theater. Uh, the number of plays I'd seen kind of my fingers. I always thought theater artists were pretentious and I knew you could make much more money at television, but I was asked to write these plays as part of a summer, as a part of a job being writer in residence for Native Earth because I'd written 
won Beachcombers. Um, I sort of got drafted in. I wrote these plays, and I'm told they were very good. And lo and behold, out of nowhere, I was suddenly a native playwright, which was very odd because I'd never heard of them growing up. Um, so what I find interesting in the changing face of contemporary literature is um, when I was growing up, there was none. A lot of us like to think the contemporary native literary renaissance began in 1986, November 22nd, 8 p.m. The wind was out of the east. Anyways, that's when a little play called The Rest Sisters premiered in uh, downtown Toronto and revolutionized the larger Canadian literary community, uh, Indigenous literary community. Um, that play revolutionized how people viewed Indigenous storytelling. It took the settler audience on a journey into this community called Sajikin Hills, which was a thinly veiled uh, Wikwimakong, and introduced them to this group of women. And it was revolutionary for a number of reasons. One, if you look at, uh, you know, I know I realize I'm talking to a bunch of uh, teachers here, Western European slash Greek um, drama dictates that you have a central character who uh, is given a goal or an objective and spends the entire story overcoming a series of obstacles to either achieve or be denied their gold, a goal. And uh, frequently they have antagonists in their way as part of this, these obstacles. If you look at Red Sisters, there are antagonists. Their basic journey is they want to go to Toronto and play at the world's biggest bingo game. That's essentially the plot. They've got these seven magnificent women who are all interrelated. They're all sisters, half-sisters, or sisters-in-law. And um, the other interesting characteristic of Western European drama is the concept of conflict. Conflict in Western European Greek drama runs everything. It's a well-known well -known concept. Drama comes from conflict, and conflict comes from characters. And you cannot really um, progress a story without having conflict and that was always a problem if you look at rest there, there, there's a bunch of secondary conflict there basically the two obstacles they have to overcome is raising money to get to toronto and overcoming a flat tire at the side of the road otherwise they're all unified in what in what they want they all have dreams of this of uh, winning the world's biggest bingo game and there's a series of monologues that helps illustrate that fact but as i was saying with indigenous people and with indigenous theater there's a slight difference our approach to conflict is slightly different it our stories don't frequently progress through conflict and that has been been that was a bit of a problem in the early years i remember uh someday i was being produced in montreal and somebody told me that they thought that the information came a little too easily and um it should there should be more fighting more more pulling the information out of the characters through conflict but again as i say we have a different way of dealing with conflict because of uh the fact that we grew up in small family groupings um uh, and just, we just have a different way of approaching it that's not to say there isn't conflict in the indigenous community it's just uh we have a different way of approaching it and not putting it all out there for everybody to see um so Again, uh, where, sorry, where was I going with that? So conflict and protagonists, those were the two different things. Because again, if you look at a lot of native theater, you look at Red Sisters, its sequel, Dried Up Side of Move to Capus Casing, there is um, no real central character. You have eight characters in each play with the equal number of importance to each character. Same number of lines. They're all the same. Same with a lot of my work. You look at some of my comedy, some of my dramas. Um, there's no real central character. In fact, when I was working on one play in uh, Michigan, somebody in the audience at the reading says, I'm a playwright myself, and I don't know who the central character of this play is. I don't know who I'm supposed to be uh, um, rooting for or, or, or following their journey. And I said, all of them. I find it more interesting to write four or six central characters than to write one central character. I mean, you know, like look at, uh, um, you know, Macbeth. Who's the central character in Macbeth? Who's the central character in death of a salesman, etc. That seems to be the focus of a lot of European drama. Now, of course, with with the, the classical uh, education now available to a lot of Native people in 
universities. I'm sure uh, it's changing. I mean, and and there are no definites here. There are there are some Western European settler plays that are more ensemble, just like there are some play indigenous plays that do have a central character that do have um, more of a, a, a traditional conflict relationship. So all these interesting things are changing now in this world. Um, uh, I keep be, I keep reading all these plays by people who are trained in uh, university. I've never been I've never been to university, and a lot of us in those early years, Thompson Highway and Daniel David Moses aside, didn't have that traditional theater training. We told stories that came from uh, the fact that when I was growing up, my grandparents used to have a huge bonfire in front of the house during the summer, several days of the week, and all my aunts, uncles, and cousins would go sit around that bonfire and tell funny stories. So I was there listening to how these stories were told, and that's where my storytelling technique comes from. So as a bizarre result, um, in many classically trained theater companies, I am known more as a storyteller than a playwright, and it has a certain amount of repercussions with it. So, um, so yeah, so that, so that was sort of the beginning of the contemporary native literary renaissance. That was the face of storytelling at that time. Prior to 1986, there were a handful of books and plays being produced here, there, but there wasn't a flood of um, such stories being told. And again, native theater, there was, um, I think there was Jessica, there's one or two plays, but they didn't revolutionize the industry the way Res Sisters did. So with all this happening, there was this explosion of indigenous theater and literature, novels, poetry, etc. post-1986. And what I found really interesting as I was in the midst of all this was the fact um, they were all dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. Almost all the stories, all the characters were either oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. And um, I understood where that was coming from. When an oppressed people get their voice back, they're going to write about being oppressed. And in this country, three, four, five hundred years of colonization of oppression, um, basically you have uh, several generations of people saying, uh, we're a little annoyed and we're going to tell you why we're annoyed. Frequently when um, an oppressed people get their voice back, they're going to write about being oppressed. So that's what was happening during those first couple decades uh, when Native people were, took their voice back and were telling stories. There were stories about um, uh, about all the, the trials, tribulations, horrors of colonization, of residential schools, reserves, uh, the scoop up, etc. Um, and most of those stories had three strains in them that I found. Uh, I'm not an academic. I don't know much. I just sort of work around in there. And most of what I found interesting is those three strains were either victim narratives, historical narratives, or, or dealing with the byproducts of what I refer to as post-contact stress disorder. So again, all these stories were coming out of the Indigenous community, um, at plays, novels, etc. And they were all, again, repeating myself, dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. And I was just getting started in this uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And I, it was sort of occurring to me that, oh my God, if I want to be a, a writer, am I going to ha basically be dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry? Because um, I was having a problem with, with that portrayal of the indigenous community because it was all negative. It was highlighting the dysfunctional aspect of the First Nations communities. And... I have been very fortunate in my life that I have traveled to over 150 First Nation communities across Canada and the United States. And everywhere I went, I was usually greeted by a laugh, a smile, and a joke. And I wasn't seeing this in our literature. I wasn't seeing this anywhere. It all was the, the dysfunctional aspect. And um, I remember talking with two Native women coming out of two different plays in two different cities. I asked them the same question. I got the same answer. What did you think of the play? And they both said, I don't think I'm going to go see any more Native plays. I'm tired of being depressed. Okay, fine. But, uh, you know, and I was uh, young, wanting to be a writer, but I didn't really want to write about these issues. Other people were doing them. I wanted to be more positive because, you know, I, I would look at my family, um, my mother. My mother had a 
fabulous sense of humor. My mother was not oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. But again, other than her sisters, I wasn't seeing positive portrayals of people, my people I knew on the stage. And then I ran into a man on the blood reserve in Alberta. I was telling him this, and he said that in his opinion, for Native people, humor is the WD-40 of healing. And that statement stayed with me. Humor is the WD-40 of healing. I loved it. I thought it was it was so perfect. It, it deserved to be on a T-shirt. Um, and that's what I decided to do. Because uh, Thompson Highway, in the uh, opening... Um, essay to the Red Sisters published version, he talks about uh, before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. And I think that's what was happening during those first 10, 20 years after Red Sisters came out. People were exposing the poison. All these problems, all these difficulties, the ramifications of colonization, people were, 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 were writing that, right? And I remember having a conversation at a conference with Maori playwrights, Aborigine, playwrights and North American indigenous playwrights. And basically we came to the conclusion that when um, uh, when you've been at the bottom of the social hierarchy for hundreds or even thousands of years, like I talked with people from India, the Dalit community who are known as the untouchables. When you've been at the bottom of the social hier hierarchy for hundreds or thousands of years, and you're given a chance finally to tell your people's story, chances are it won't be a comedy. Right. So Thompson Highway has that saying before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. And then this elder I was talking to said that for him, humor was WD 40 of healing. So I looked at it as, 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 in a very unique way. The poison needed to be exposed. It was necessary. It had to be dealt with. And there were so many other better writers than me. That could do that, that would do that, that are doing that. Me, I was more interested in the healing than exposing the poison. So I decided to 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 push my career and explore my career more through the celebration of indigenous humor. So I would do that. I would do that in my writing. I did a documentary on it for the NFB. I did a book on it for uh, Douglas and McIntyre called Me Funny. And I've written comedies, I've written dramas with humor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, am, I even... Um, co-developed a native sitcom on APTN, uh, all these different things. So that was my contribution to this world. But what's really exciting, really interesting about what's happening now is those three th uh, strains I told you about, victim narratives, um, uh, historical narratives, and the byproducts of post-contact stress disorder. The Indigenous voice is beginning to um, differ. It's beginning to take new directions of exploration. What's really interesting now is there's um, indigenous theaters beginning to develop itself, not theater, sorry, indigenous literature is beginning to develop itself in genre fiction, right? Uh, Daniel Heath Justice did a trilogy of um, sword and sorcery books where there's dwarves, there's, there's um, magic, there's swords, all these different things. Sort of an indigenous Lord of the Rings. Um, Kateri Akowinsi Dam has a uh, has edited and compiled a book of international indigenous erotica. Think of it as Fifty Shades of Red. Um, uh, Tom King, when he's not doing award-winning fiction, nonfiction, his hobby is writing murder mysteries. My first novel was a native vampire novel. My second novel was a genre I was not, I was completely unaware of. It was called um, Magic Realism. Um, my last collection of short stories were native science fiction short stories. And what's really exciting about that is suddenly science fiction is very much in, in today's society. You've got um, The Marrow Thieves by uh, Sherry Demerlane. Um, you've got Moon of the Crested Snow by... Uh, uh, Wab Rice, Wabagishik Rice. There's a collection of LGBT short science fiction short stories currently out there. In America, one of the leading sci-fi writers is a woman named Rebecca Roanhorse, who wrote a book called um, Trail of Lightning, which takes place on the Navajo reservation in a future dystopian world. And what's so interesting about all that is 
her, she's so highly respected, so popular that she was actually hired by the Star Wars Corporation to write one of their one off Star Wars novels. And she's done it. So and um, a novel that uh, I'm not exaggerating. Once I get off here, I'm 15 pages away from finishing um, is a native horror novel. So what's exciting, as I said, what's exciting now are the different faces, the different different ways Indigenous people are setting up and telling their stories. And um, we're beginning, you know, there's there's musicals happening out there, all sorts of different fun, exciting stuff that is happening out there, telling the Indigenous story out there. Um, one of my books, um, Take Us to Your Chief, which is a collection of my, my um, sci-fi short stories, at first... Uh, when I pitched it to one of my publishers, they, they were a little, they basically said there's no such thing as native science fiction at that time. And I said, there is now. And one of the reasons I wanted to write it is because I grew up in almost every native person my age and younger grew up reading a, or watching a lot of science fiction. And I knew native people were interested in science fiction. And... Um, but most of the publishers thought it was a contradiction in term, native science fiction. They're so used to native people looking backwards, or as they think we're looking backwards, what we lost, what we're trying to keep, what we're trying to regain and put in our lives, that I wanted to turn that lens around and look at the future. Where will we be in 50, 100, 500 years? But they thought that we weren't interested in that. But one of the interesting things that was happening around that time is that when there was this flood of... Um, of reports from high schools and universities where they were using indigenous literature, they're making it mandatory in several grades. And the thing about the sci-fi book I was doing or other books, uh, other sci-fi books or other genre books is that basically we're doing everything that the mainstream indigenous writers are doing. We're exploring the human condition, the indigenous condition. We're just using different tools like like, like um, again, science fiction. So I knew that I knew teachers would be looking for new ways of of teaching the indigenous experience. And um, sci-fi is as uh, explores the human condition as much as anything else does. If it's good sci-fi, so I knew there'd be an audience for it, and it's actually done very, very well. Um, and I, I and it also makes. I think studying a lot more interesting when it's a lot more fun. Anyways, I'm sort of rambling on here. Does anybody have questions as I'm as I'm sort of yakety yakety here? Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Michelle Catino if I I know that she's probably got a lot of um, uh, similarities in the work that she's involved in, and so maybe and I know that she has to leave early. So Michelle, did you want to um, comment at this point? Yeah, I'm so fired up right now. I can't even tell you. <laughs> um, fired up about what? Just fired up about your message, right? So the first thing I, I did is I tweeted what you talked about is the passport, right? A book, as a young person, you saw novels and books as a passport into another world. And I think thought about that in terms of where are we taking our kids? Are we always taking them to the same destination, right? Are we always going to Europe together? Um, yeah. Or where are we, are we exploring the entire world and all it has to offer? So that's my first comment. And, and I think that's the question we need to ask as educators. You know what, start by, if you, a lot of people say, if you wanna lose weight, keep a food journal, right? Write down every resource that you bring into your classroom within a month or a year, and then reflect on it and say, where are the destinations we went to? Where did we take these students? What are the worlds did we lead them to see? And the other thing I love that you talked about was, I mean, humor. Anyone who knows me knows that, you. that. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but okay. So I I'll just wait till that. he's coming back on. Oh, I hi Drew. I wanted to also say that you know humor is a is a, because I know when we talk of issues of um, 
racism and um, oppression, there's always that tension in the room. And I find that humor cuts that tension so we can have the conversation. Um, it, so it's that great, it's almost like that starter. Okay, let's get, let's address the elephant in the room and get to the conversation. And the last thing I want to share is I love your idea of oppressed, suppressed, and depressed. <laughs> because yes. Thinking about kids who are listening to stories about themselves, they may be so thrilled to actually be in a situation where they're hearing their own narrative, but what is the narrative that we're telling? So I don't have any questions, but I know the chat is full of them, but I just wanted to thank you for sharing those few things. My pleasure. Great. Did you want to, uh, do you want to take some questions from the chat right now or? Sure. Let me just comment on that first. Yeah. Um, like one of the things I remember from my my uh, I went to school in Lakefield District Secondary School, 20 minutes from my reserve. We were bused there. And I remember in high school, like, you know, that basically there are three books of, um, of, of that a lot of young people are, are, uh, are made to study and have a, like there, there are three classifications. Either you're a um, Oh, what's it? A catcher in a rye. You're a the outsiders, or you're a um, to kill a mockingbird. And I never really got um, uh, catcher in a rye. I read it. I did not understand it above the the obvious. The outsiders that. I, I reread it every year for about five years. That really connected with me. The out, you know, literally the story, even though it's about about white pseudo gangs in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As a native youth, I really, really recognized it, um, and I really appreciated the writing of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. So again, it, it has to do with what people are are familiar with or can can relate to. Um, and when I, like when I write my stuff, even though there's an indigenous flavor to it, because one of the questions I always get asked is, do you write for a native audience or a non-native audience? Well, I'm half native, I'm half white. I like to say I'm, um, I'm biracial, but unicultural. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I think, I think really good literature appeals to all people. My stuff is taught in Germany and I've had stuff taught in, of all places, India etc. So there's a, a question here in the chat. Um, your writing has always been joyful and funny with the exception most recently of chasing painted horses, which seems seem to be exploring the depth of the trauma of Danielle. Why was this so divergent from your other works? Um, well, that that's one of my most favorite things I've ever written, right? It started out as a short story in my collection, Fearless Warriors. And then I did it as a one-act play for kids, uh, Girl Loved Her Horses. But every time I wrote it, it was like, it's like, it's one of the few things I reread and I go, wow, I wrote that. And I don't know. I, yes, I do have a reputation for humor. And I think there is some humor in that, in that book. But... It's just, I don't know, it's just a story that, that, that reached out and grabbed me, wouldn't let go until I could tell the full story in a completely um, a complete novel environment. Uh, you know, as, as somebody, years and years ago, for all the old people listening, you know, uh, Sting, the, the musician, went through a period of where he was doing a lot of jazz-oriented music. And he had the best jazz musicians playing on, on his album and on his tour. And somebody said, why are you working with Sting and, and to this really great jazz saxophonist or guitarist? And they said, well, you know, it's like you may really like Italian food, but every once in a while you want to have you want to have Chinese or Greek. And so for me, humor is very important to me, but occasionally you come on a situation, a story that's best told straight. And I still maintain there's humor in that book, in that story, but I wrote according to the dictates of the character in the story. Thank you. Another question. One thing that has been noticed is that there isn't a typical sat quote unquote satisfying conclusion to a number of newer indigenous novels like The Marrow Thieves, and Moon of the Crested Snow, etc. 
Do you think that this is a new format or is there a similarity to oral story traditions? Well, um, and you can throw um, what we just discussed, uh, Chasing Painted Horses in there. It has, a, it has a, a rather unique ending to it, but it, it could be. Um, I, again, I don't know how people, their backgrounds, you, you watch a lot of television now. It's much, there's much more of a through line carrying through the, the entire season rather than the rather one-off episodics. So that could have an influence on how people are telling stories. Um, I personally believe, you know, in, in, in some of my, in a lot of my writings, that just the story is never finished being told. Um, a life is never finished being lived. Uh, and I just think it's just sort of the new the new feel. You have, you have, you have people who break down all the stuff into postmodern, postcolonial stuff. So, yeah, it could be just a new form of, um, of, of attacking a story. Uh, one of my novels, Motorcycles and Sweetgrass, every once in a while somebody will say, you know, it's perfectly ripe for a, a sequel, and who knows, someday maybe I will do a sequel to it. Um, uh, but hard, hard to say. So, it, yeah, it could be a new style of writing. It leaves it open, and more than anything else, I like working in unison with the audience, where I, I take it to this point, and I let the audience take it from there forward. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from Stephen Paquette, but I'm going to ask Steve, do you want to come, do you want to unmute and ask your question yourself? Just give you a minute there if you wanted to unmute Steve. Okay, well, I'll ask the question then on his <laughs> behalf. Uh, did you experience any resistance by publishers at the beginning of your journey writing? Um, uh, as I said, I went through I went through stages. I started off writing for television. My very first writing credit for all you old fogies out there was an episode of a show called The Beachcombers a thousand years ago. I, I was 12. Um, and then from there, I went into theater. And as I said, there was this glorious explosion of theater in the late 80s. And it was very, very easy to get published and to find people who, who were interested in the work you were doing. Um, but as I got up towards short stories and novels, no. Um, in fact, my very first novel, which was a native vampire novel, um, a, a youth book by Anik Press. Um, the, the protagonist is a, a 350-year-old novel and the other protagonist is a 16-year-old girl on a reserve. Um, I was approached. I got a phone call back in the days when people phoned each other and not emailed saying, would you like to come out to have lunch with us? We'd like to talk with you. I, I went out and they pitched the idea of me writing them a novel. I had never wanted to write a novel. Novels scared me. Um, you know, and they, um, but they offered to uh, give me an advance, so they cheated. So I, I said yes, and I was trying to decide what I wanted to write because, again, I was in this period of where everybody's doing these dark, depressing, bleak things. And while my vampire novel is kind of dark and and bleak, it has more of a gothic, fun feel to it. So um, they approached me. I did it. I sent it off. They loved it. It was published, and it's done very, very well. In fact, it did. So so well as a novel they came to me about three four years later saying we've had requests to turn it into a graphic novel so we turned it into a graphic novel and afterwards i ended up doing a, a, a full-fledged <laughs> adult novel as i call it uh called motorcycles and sweetgrass and it was actually very uh i had fun writing it and it, I thought, anybody familiar with it, there's a whole subplot involving raccoons. My agent actually asked me to, to, to write out or, or edit out the, uh, the raccoons because, as she said, your, um, your, a lot of your dominant audience will be urban dwellers who hate raccoons and they'll immediately hate it. But I kept it in and everybody seemed to love it. Um, and uh, the third novel, as I said, came out a little while ago, uh, Chasing Painted Horses. I've actually never really had much of a problem. I mean, I'd have, in some cases, with something like a Motorcycle and Sweetgrass, which is such an unusual story, 
Um, there are some people who um, the way the way a lot of publishing houses work is you have two departments. You have the editorial staff and you have the marketing staff. And then two publishers loved the book, but the marketing staff said we have absolutely no idea how to market this. A story about the, a contemporary a story about Nana Bush in a contemporary society uh, dealing with uh, contemporary issues and raccoons. They didn't know how to market it. So um, I, there's been some difficulty, but I've never really had much of a problem finding a home for most of the most of the work I have had published. Um, Chasing Painted Horses was my 33rd book. So I've been doing pretty good. So I, I jumped the gun a little too soon. Uh, Steve was coming off of mute, so I'm going to come back to Steve in case you had a follow up or a comment you wanted to add to your question there, Steve. So I will I'll practice patience a little <laughs> and give you the time. Okay, so he's saying in the chat, not there yet. Go ahead. All right. Um, okay, so on to the next question uh, from Paula. What is the role of audience in the way you envision humor? Does it matter who tells the joke and who hears it? Or are there certain universals you're striving to find that unite audiences? Oh my God. Uh, I did a, um, I uh, edit and compiled a book deconstructing humor called Me Funny. And in it, I talk about the Heisenberg principle, where um, if I'm remembering it correctly, and I don't know if you have any physics professors up there, where they talk about you can either know where a particle is or where it's going, or and by knowing where it's going, it changes where it's going to arrive. There's some big, long psychological thing. And it's like humor, right? Yeah, you, um, you can, you, you, uh, the, the operation was a success, but the patient died. So in breaking down humor, it's very difficult to break it down in humor, especially cultural humor. When I'm sitting writing, I just try and write as I'm writing. Um, and I, I don't actually try to be funny because one of the first rules I learned as an up and coming writer is the minute you try to be funny, it sounds like you're trying to be funny. It's got to be organic. It's got to flow from the story and the characters. And I think I've been doing it long enough, 30 years, that basically um, it, it's, it comes naturally for me. Um, I don't try and write for a native or a non-native audience in terms of humor, though I do think, uh, you know, as a First Nations person growing up on the reserve, traveling to all these different places, I'm very well versed in Indigenous humor for obvious reasons. However, when I go home at night, you know, I, I watch uh, The Simpsons, I watch Big Bang Theory, I watch all these shows um, coming from Hollywood of contemporary humor. And so I am well versed in both. So when I sit down, it's it's I'm ambidextrous when it comes to both. Some jokes I will do where only native people will get the joke, and on occasion I'll sometimes do a joke where, essentially, uh, mostly um, non-native urban people will get the joke. So it it depends. I don't have a I don't have a set pattern. I just sit down, and I riff off of what my characters are doing, where they come from, and what they're trying to say. Okay, Steve, I see you figured it out. <laughs> yes, I did. Can you hear me? Yes, I can you hear can. You. Very good. I had to get my youngest daughter to uh, help me out with some technical support. Okay, go ahead. If you... Did you have a follow up or a comment? Yeah, I, I just I just wanted to ask is, is that um, in the stories that you tell, um, and again, it, it, it's a different approach to literature. It's a different style that um, people are used to. Um, and in your journey of, of writing uh, from the beginning, um, have you ever encountered any resistance um, to the way that you tell your stories? Uh, not so much the way. I mean, every once in a while, I like to poke the bear. I don't know if anybody out there is familiar with a story I wrote like 25 years ago. It was It's an essay called Pretty Like a White Boy. Yes. I, sort of, I, I explore what it's like being a fair-skinned Indian. And it, there are two versions of it. I wrote it 
when I was young, when I was angry, ready to take on the world, and I was so tired of having to explain where I come from. That's where my, my one of my standard jokes, I'm half Ojibwe, half Caucasian, so technically that makes me an occasion, comes from. <laughs> and there are two versions of that essay out there. One where, um, if you'll forgive me, I talk about um, breast implants. and But the play is very, very, the play, the, the essay is very, very successful and is used in a lot of high schools because it deals with identity issues in a very humorous way. And somewhere in the process, they've edited out some of the more uh, aggressive, politically incorrect comments I've made that back then I was just pissed off at the world and I didn't care what I said. So um, there's an essay, there's a version of it out there that sort of has been cleansed for usage. Um, my most recent play, most recent book in production and in publication is called Cottagers and Indians. And when it was produced and it toured a bit, a lot of the box offices would get complaints, either email or phone complaints, that I had dared to use the term Indian, right? Um, and obviously the, the, it has to do with a uh, controversy happening up in the Kortha Lakes about wild rice and a guy who's planting wild rice in all the lakes as a form of, a, of uh, indigenous sovereignty. Um, and I was using the term cottagers and Indians as a play on cowboys and Indians, which even on the reserve, we, we grew up playing cowboys and Indians. Um, but these, these box offices would get complaints from people saying that I should not use the term Indian. It's very, very bad. It's very racist, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not really seeing the joke. Um, but again, the irony of the whole thing being is that to the best of our knowledge, most of those complaints came from white people. Most native people saw what I was doing, saw the irony, the twist of cowboy, cowboys and Indians, cottagers and Indians, and the sort of alliteration that came with it. So on occasion, I get that sort of feed, negative feedback from the dominant audiences. And um, but other than that, I, I, I can't really think. Oh, one time <laughs> I did a play called Alternatives. And it was playing in wonderful downtown Vancouver. And I got a phone call one day, again, back in the days when people phoned, um, saying that the artistic director of the theater company uh, had asked me, did you hear what happened last night? And I said, no, not really. And they said, somebody had phoned in and left a message saying, did you, uh, so if this theater is going to continue to produce plays that are racist against white people, don't be surprised at what we leave behind. It was a bomb threat. So um, they canceled the performance that night. They brought in all these bomb dog, bomb sniffing dogs, etc. And of course, there was nothing there. But I got it was one of the harshest forms of, of criticism, of literary criticism I've ever I've ever gotten in my life. Thank you, Steve, for your questions. Uh, we have going to we have a few more here. Uh, do you start with characters or plot when you write? Is there a method? Um, I'm, there may be a method. I do not know uh, the way and I work in both ways. Sometimes I have an idea for a play and then I have to create characters that best fit that play. And a play like my, my, my trilogy on uh, Native adoption, Someday, Only Drunks and Children Tell the Truth, 400 Kilometers, I came up with the story and I thought, okay, I'm going to need people to, for the story. I'm going to need a family that stayed on a reserve. I'm going to need an adoptee. I'd like to have an outside person viewing this whole thing and telling a story about it. So that came up with the boyfriend and I did it like that. And then when I did the second, the, the second vert play in the trilogy i figured okay um I've got, i want to have a, a fourth person come in that is that was also adopted but raised on the on the reserve so yeah i would come up with the issue rather than the characters same with um play i did called dead white writer where i dealt with stereotypes of indigenous people and i would come up with the stereotypes okay i have these stereotypes how do i explore the stereotypes dramatically and this was a tough play to write it took me 10 years to write it and i finally went through it and i came up with how to how the story that needed to be told um 
through the characters. So in that in that particular play, I started with the characters, then the story. And the adoption, I came up with the issue and then did the characters. Um, and sometimes they come together. The play I just told you about, Cottagers and Indians, because it's a real series of incidents happening in the Kawartha Lakes right now. It told itself. I had the character of uh, the native guy planting the wild rice. I had the cottagers who didn't want the rice planted, and it just sort of fell into itself naturally. So uh, it, it depends. Sometimes you have the characters and you have to figure out what can I do with them. Other times you want to tell a story, but you don't know. You have to come up with the characters to tell that story properly. Uh, next question is, how do you know when, quote, it's done, quote, for your storytelling? <laughs> well, as I said, this afternoon, I'm I'm um, proving the last 15 pages of my first draft of my horror novel. And the process is, I think that first draft is done. But there's that old saying I'm sure you're all familiar with. There is no such thing as a good writer, only a good rewriter. So I'm done with it. I send it off uh, and whoever whatever publisher decides they want to um do it they will put me in touch with a story editor they'll read it through objectively come back with a series of rewrites that they want me to put in and so i go through it and then usually the first the first edit you know structural and then the second and third edit edit are more dealing with the details of the of the exact language or so um so you do what you can you take it as far as you can as a writer and then if a theater company wants to produce the play, you workshop it or you work with the director, dramaturge, and, and work at it. So it's a give and take. Very, very rarely have I had the opportunity to work on a project where the draft I put in is the final draft, is the is is how it is. Because I've, I've actually been in a situation where I've had one play, first draft, actually produced and it wasn't as good as it should have been and basically i was sort of wincing when i watched it and thought this could use a second third possibly fourth draft thank you uh next question is can you speak about berlin berlin blues what are your thoughts on cultural appreciation versus appropriation Ah, uh, yes. Berlin Blues, one of my favorite all favorite comedies I wrote. Um, and also it was the leap. OK, uh, those not familiar with it. Um, Germany has a bizarre fondness for North American Aboriginal culture. I have done 19 lecture tours of Germany, which is so odd in itself, as I've always believed I look more German than native. But I go over. And I, I lecture all across the country on native literature, native humor, native theater, native culture, a um, whole bunch of native, native history, etc. And the reason being, in the 1880s, there was a German writer named Karl May who wrote a series of westerns called Winnetou, which is the name of an Apache warrior. <clears throat> and um, these novels became part of a subculture and they developed into more of a subculture after where, where there are people who dress up as native people they did movies and television series based on these novels and um uh basically the five six seven generations of germans grew up loving these novels there are towns where they have Karl my festivals where they've adapted the the novels in to plays and um, German culture has just completely embraced these plays and they're heavily romanticized about the noble warrior. And here's something really twisted and really, really weird. Three of Karl May's greatest fans were um, uh, it's Albert Einstein um, and Adolf Hitler. In fact, Hitler and Joseph Goebbels and the the elite of the Nazi party were so enamored with his writings that Hitler actually made North American indigenous people honorary Aryans, if you can understand that. So based on this love of indigenous people, every time I would go over and lecture, I would hear about Karl May, I would hear about Winnetou, and I began to see more and more of this sort of 
fascination of this full indigenous culture so that I had to write a play about this German fascination. So I wrote a play called The Berlin Blues, which is about a German business conglomerate that comes to a small central Ontario First Nations community wanting to build the world's largest native theme park called Ojibwe World um, because it's Ojibwe-tastic. And with such things as um, bumper canoes, uh, a 44 meter high dream, in dream catcher with interlacing laser beam webbing that keeps killing all the birds and a production of Dances with Wolves, the musical. So, um, so that play has been, I did that about 10, 12 years ago. It's been very, very successful. In fact, about three years ago, I went over with a film crew and we ended up shooting a documentary, going to German powwows, talking with German academics and going to see these plays um, about yeah. Winnetou and Karl May. And uh, we did as a documentary that aired on CBC two years ago. And basically it was the highest rated documentary on CBC television that year. Um, so again, yeah, so it, it, it's just representative of this German fascination with North American Aboriginal culture. So I see here it's two o'clock and I know that we could probably <coughs> go on for another good hour with so many questions. And uh, I'm just gonna ask, actually, before I turn it back over to Steve, I just wanna uh, point your direction to the chat box. Uh, Priya has put in there an exit ticket. If you could, um, and we'll follow up with an email, if you can fill that out, that would be very helpful for us as we try and plan these sessions to help support you as educators in the classroom. Um, and uh, on my behalf, I just want to say it was really great to actually somewhat meet you. <laughs> 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 We've been chatting over email, so it's nice to actually somewhat. Uh, I feel like, you know, you're you're starting to become a human for me. Um, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to Steve to uh, more formally thank you. Yes, beautiful. Ani, bonjour, my brother. How are you? Oh, therapy is helping. You too, eh? Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, to start off. Um, by acknowledging you, uh, your spirit, uh, I wanted to acknowledge the spirit of your ancestors uh, that walk with you. Uh, I want to say, Chimigwich, thank you so much uh, for allowing us uh, to walk with you for this short time. Um, I also want to thank Jody and, and, and the school board out there for creating this opportunity. Um, Drew, I, I want to say thank you for, um, you know, sharing that uh, Indigenous perspective um, with the, our non-Indigenous world. Um, one of the things that I always struggle is, is not being in person with somebody. Um, but what I want to say is, is that your spirit uh, in this conversation has been so strong this afternoon um, that I just want to let you know that I feel connected with your spirit as I think that a lot of other people do. Uh, I want to thank you for just sharing just a small snapshot uh, of your journey with us. Um, you know, the storytelling is, is, is just one of many gifts that you have. Uh, and I think that one of the gifts on top of that is your unique ability to interject humor into those stories, which allows people to feel comfortable. Um, as Indigenous people, um, we know that humor is medicine. Um, and some people don't always understand that. I always say to some people that, um, well, sometimes I laugh because if I don't laugh, I'll cry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted to say, um, you know, I look very, very forward to seeing you again. Um, and thank you so much for being a part of our journey. Uh, this evening when uh, the sun goes down, uh, I want to let you know, my brother, that um, I'm going to lay down tobacco uh, in acknowledgement of your spirit and uh, with great gratitude and appreciation for being here with us. So I say uh, miigwech, brother. As we say in my reserve, grazie. Aha, grazie. <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you again for sharing your time with us. And uh, in the in the chat box, there's all kinds of just beautiful comments towards um, their appreciation for you 
in the time today um, with us and yeah, so uh, we do have, like I said, we'll follow up with that exit ticket and uh, there is another, we are running another session that's almost the exact same to this through uh, FNMI EAO, the First Nation Métis Inuit Education Association of Ontario. So when we do our follow up email, um, I will share out that link in case um, you are, if you want to hear again, or if you know of other people that might be mm. interested in joining that session as well. Uh, so we'll see you on that session, Drew, and thank you again for your time here. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, go with God. Oh. <laughs> that would apply for our board, actually. Yay. <laughs> Tough from Peel Catholic. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. All right, what do we got here?